Hello, welcome to Red Reads. Today I am talking about a non-fiction book on this channel, which I guess is pretty rare. I usually talk about a fiction or literature, but this is, uh, well, I guess the closest to literature that a non-fiction book could be. It's How to Read Red Literature Like a Professor by Thomas C. Foster. Uh, and this was a very fun read. It was, uh, I would say it was, it ping-ponged between being pretty educational to very educational, which is really nice. Uh, and as you can expect for uh, for people who read and also for if you've talked about uh, books and if you've tried to uh, like articulate your thoughts and tried to do deep reading, then as you might expect, there are going to be parts of this book that are like, duh inducing obvious and you're like, I can't believe not everyone sees this. And then things that are sort of like, oh, I can't believe I never saw things like this. Um, and then in the middle ground, uh, the way in the way that Foster uh, wrote, it's really nice to just be like, I think that's the most succinct way I've ever seen someone talk about this. So, uh, for example, what are the point? What's the point of dinner scenes? Well, they're acts of communion, and I'm like, yeah, that's like the the easiest way to describe it to somebody. And so that that's basically the spectrum, I, I would say, uh, of reading this book. I got onto it because I heard uh, Chris at Leaf by Leaf talking about it, but I think also Nicole from A Day of Small Things. Uh, they've both talked about it uh, with with um, considerable praise, and I thought, yeah. Yeah, at the very least, I could. Uh, I'll learn a lot at the best, and or at the very least, I'll sort of figure out new ways to talk about things that I already know. Um, I'll quickly talk about. Uh, I'll, I'll quickly read from the table of contents just to give you uh, just to give you all an idea of some of the ways uh, the ways he structured it or what the chapters are about, and then I'll skip through talk about uh, some of the highlights that I found that I really liked. So uh, number one. Uh, Every trip is a quest, except when it's not. And he starts talking about the crying of Lot Forty Nine, which is uh, suspended right here. So, as as you can tell, uh, it is a it was off to a good start with this book. Uh, it talks about acts of communion uh, by eating. Uh, when in doubt, it's from Shakespeare or the Bible. Uh, he talks about uh, the seasons and geography, which was another one of those things where I was sort of like, "Whoa, okay, I've not thought about this anywhere near as much as I need to." And so it was great to um, great to read about it. Is that a symbol? Uh, yes, she's a Christ figure too. It's all about sex, except sex, and then reasons for illnesses, and um, and uh, he spends probably not as much time as I would have liked, uh, but about ten pages. He has a chapter talking about irony, uh, because he uh, Foster sort of alludes throughout the book that irony trumps everything, and I thought that it was going to be maybe a more a more substantial section, but uh, it seemed like he covered everything he wanted to, but. Um, yeah, th that's pretty much what you can expect uh, uh, going into the book. It is really, it, uh, it is written in a very sort of palatable way. There are some times when, uh, you know, the author's um, idiosyncrasies and, and his sense of humor will come in, which I, I tend to ping pong with that, where sometimes I like it and sometimes I'm just like, you've already sort of convinced me by the premise that just give me the details. I don't necessarily need seducing uh, into like continuing to read, but um, yeah, I still think it was, I still think it was great. Anyway, I think that's pretty much all I want to say general about it. I'll just jump in and start talking about uh, specific highlights or sections that I liked. So he writes about, this is in uh, Nice to Eat With You, Acts of Communion, and he's talking about uh, a scene in The Dead, uh, a short story by James Joyce from Dubliners, where he's uh, he's got the people sitting down at this dinner table and he just spends like a whole chapter, uh, or a whole paragraph rather, uh, really explicitly highlighting everything that's on the table. And so I'm not going to read it, but uh, Foster writes that, Joyce's main goal, though, is to draw us into that moment, to pull our chairs up to that table so that we are utterly convinced of the reality of that meal. And I like that a lot because it provides an answer to the sort of, um, you know, everything needs to be a symbol or... Uh, and then people on the opposite side saying, uh, if there's a blue curtain, it's just because it's blue, uh, which both of those things are sort of really, really annoying. Uh, and sometimes like a blue curtain doesn't have to be a symbol for anything. Uh, and sometimes it can just be setting up uh, and making a scene more detailed. But then also it's sort of too lazy to just be like a blue curtain's just blue because why would you even, because 
uh, if you're going to just read surface level, like why bother uh, trying to talk detailed about it anyway? Um, but I did like that uh, on top of the fact that, you know, uh, dinner scenes uh, or eating scenes are acts of communion communion and they're usually uh, for to push another part of the story, it, there is also a case for just detail for the sake of realism. And in the following section, Nice to Eat You, Acts of Vampirism, uh, he's, uh, so there's, he does talk about vampires, but he talks about sort of the philosophy or, or the, um, the meaning of vampirism in relationships and like uh, sucking and taking away people's life energies and in toxic relationships and whatnot. And near the end, he summarizes it in this nice statement uh, with, in order to remain undead, I must steal the life force of someone whose fate matters less to me than my own. And that's just a, a very, uh, that, that is a way that contextualizes vampires, but also helps you to be able to see uh, vampires in other, in other uh, scenarios. And something I really like that he talked about is uh, whether you like it or not, so much of Western literature is steeped in Bible, in the Bible and in uh, Bible stories. And he writes, when I feel that resonance, uh, something that feels heavy yet sparkles with promise or portent, it almost always means the phrase or whatever is borrowed from something from somewhere else and promises special significance. More often than not, particularly if the borrowing feels different in tone and weight from the rest of the prose, that somewhere is the Bible. And this is another great case for that he makes for uh, why old stories are still resonate with us. So he, he talks about, he's talking about the, the Iliad and he's like, uh, or the Iliad and the Odyssey. And he's like, you know, these are old stories. They're filled with bloodshed. Why, why do they relate to us at all? And uh, he writes that what Homer can do though is place them in situations where their nobility and their courage are put to the test while reminding us that they are acting out some of the most basic, most primal patterns known to humans. The need to protect one's family is Hector, the need to maintain one's dignity, Achilles, the determination to remain faithful and to have faith, Penelope, the struggle to return home, Odysseus. Uh, Homer gives us four great struggles of, of the human being, with nature, with the divine, with other humans, and with ourselves. What is there, after all, against which we need to prove ourselves but those four things? And I really love that he talks about this intrinsic paradox with rain. He's talking about uh, rain uh, and seasons and uh, just the weather, I guess. Uh, one of the paradoxes of rain is how clean it is coming down and how much mud it can make when it lands. So if you want a character to be cleansed symbolically, let him walk through the rain to get, uh, to get somewhere. Uh, and then... Uh, but... Oh, another thing I forgot to mention as well is that, of course, he will draw on some examples in order to, you know, to provide examples of when this shows up in actual literature. Uh, and so there are going to be spoilers. I would generally say uh, to be familiar with most of Hemingway and uh, uh, Toni Morrison's core works, uh, because those are the ones that he talks about a lot. And I think Foster did a good job in constantly coming back to those. So he's not really spoiling a lot of big things. And actually, what I like as well is that he's sort of structured the sentences such that he says the name of the book first, so you can almost be like, "Oh, I haven't read this," and then just skip down to the next to the next uh, sentence if you if you really really don't want to see a spoiler for something. This was something that I really loved because I know I've definitely been uh, responsible for this in the past of using allegory and symbol basically synonymously. But um, in the section called "Is that a symbol?" he talks about the multiple interpretations of symbols as opposed to allegories where he writes uh, even in a fairly clear-cut case we can't pin down a single meaning although they're pretty close so some symbols do have a relatively limited range of meanings but in general a symbol can't be reduced to standing for only one thing if they can it's not symbolism it's allegory and jumping down on the page a little bit he talks about how with animal farm Orwell is desperate for us to get the point, not a point. And so Animal Farm is allegorical, not symbolic. I do love that he has a whole section. This is uh, from Yeah, She's a Christ Figure 2 of just a whole, a whole list of things that are Jesus-y. And so if your character, uh, if these happen to your character, it could be a certain thing. And I'll read them out because they're all really funny. Uh, number one, crucified, wounds in the hands, feet, side, and head. Number two, in agony, 
Three, self-sacrificing. Four, good with children. Five, good with loaves, fishes, water, wine. Six, 33 years of age when last seen. Seven, employed as a carpenter. Eight, known to use humble modes of transportation, feet or donkeys preferred. Nine, believed to have walked on water. Ten, often portrayed with arms outstretched. Eleven, known to have spent time alone in the wilderness. Twelve, believed to have had a confrontation with the devil, possibly tempted. Thirteen, last seen in the company of thieves. Fourteen, creator of many aphorisms and parables. Fifteen, buried but arose on the third day. Sixteen, had disciples. Twelve at first, although not all equally devoted. Seventeen, very forgiving. Eighteen, came to redeem an unworthy world. And it's so funny because there are little things that where now I've found myself jumping at shadows. So I'm reading a naked singularity and there's a part where the main character is like changing a car battery. And he talks about in the process of changing the car battery, he scraped up his hands. And I was just like, oh, is he Jesus? You know, so you start to sort of look for it everywhere. Uh, and really that's, that's like the most fun thing. That's what Foster is talking about is just seeing all of those connections. And that, uh, that web is, is what is that that's the, because if you've decided to start doing deep reading and you've uh, and you you decide to forego surface level reading, then really all that you get that sustains you is uh, those connections. And this is what I really really love. He talks. It's it's the section. It's all about sex. Dot dot dot. And then the next chapter. Uh, this one is except sex. Uh, and he says. When they're writing about other things, they really mean sex. And when they write about sex they really mean something else. If they, write, if they write about sex and mean strictly sex, we have a word for that, pornography. And in the section where he's talking about uh, irony, he says, whereas normally in literary works, we watch characters who are our equals or even superiors, in an ironic work, we watch characters struggle futilely with forces we might be able to overcome. And just reading that made me realize how many things are uh, sort of post 1950, 60, and just things that we see today have a sense of irony to them. And uh, kind of building uh, upon that, uh, a few pages later, he writes, uh, irony works because the audience understands something that eludes one or more of the characters. And what I did really like is that at the very end, he includes a uh, reading list of primary works. Um, so he talks about, uh, uh, just looking at some ones, he talks about James Baldwin, he talks about Samuel Beckett, Beowulf, uh, Angela Carter, Lewis Carroll, Raymond Carver, uh, Chaucer, Conrad, Coover, uh, a, a really a lovely list um, just to end like, you know, a sentence or maybe a paragraph on what's good about them. Yeah, and even what I liked a lot is fairy tales that we can't uh, live without and movies to read. So he talks about uh, um, Woody Allen. He talks really funnily enough, uh, Avatar, the James Cameron movie, uh, Citizen Kane, uh, I'm trying to think, uh, the Indiana Jones movies, uh, Star Wars, and so on. And then just a list of secondary uh, sources, different things. Um, overall, very, very educational read. And I loved it a lot. I'm definitely going to recommend it to a lot of people uh, if they want to get into it. Um, or if, you know, similar to me, they've sort of just started their, their journey of, of deeper reading in literature and they want new ways or, or new approaches. Uh, the big takeaway, uh, like I said, is just that I need to keep reading, need to get a lot more of those references and to just kind of constantly keep asking why, uh, like why is this included? And um, I also liked that, I really, really loved that the distinction between symbol and allegory, because once you let a symbol be what you get out of it, then uh, you kind of have responsibility for it, but you also get a greater sense of satisfaction. Uh, whereas an allegory, you might kind of actually just be wrong when you think about what they're, what they're talking about. In uh, any case, recommend some other uh, nonfiction books that are similar to this, because I'd love to read them and I'd love to get more into it. Um, uh, and thank you for watching. I'll see you in the next video.